competition on the grand sports have demonstrated that they can do a tremendous performance with all of this um, bespoke and custom work. And you can see it in George's car, but this bears no relation to a traditional Corvette. This is really a custom built race car. And um, it is uh, at that point that uh, the word gets out that Chevrolet is essentially racing without telling anybody. And the word comes down to, um, to stop formal racing, stop the formal activities. And with that, I think I'll turn it back to you because I think George can tell the story much better than I can. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, George, we uh, would love, we've got actually two of your cars uh, out here. Uh, the, uh, the number nine uh, Corvette that uh, was the very first car of Penske Racing. And at the very first race, Daytona in 1966, you guys won the GT class, uh, but you had uh, some, some interesting uh, aspects to that race. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what happened with that? Well, did, did, did you have the photographs up there? I, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are floating up there. They are yes, floating yes. up there. Well, not, in fact, I, I checked with Ed, Ed Relburn uh, for permission to tell this story. But um, I've, know, I've known Roger for quite a while. He lived back quite near where I grew up. More or less grew up in, in uh, uh, the main line of Philadelphia and uh, got to know him a little bit through, through motor racing and got together with him as far as racing. Um, he, his last race ever uh, was in the number five Grand Sport Coupe. Um, I had another car that I had taken down to the Nassau Speed Weeks, but for some reason we couldn't get it going. And so I, I, I and a friend of mine, uh, decided that let's, let's give up, make an offer to Roger to buy that coupe, and we'll run it at Seaman uh, the next spring. Well, uh, I was learning about Corvettes. I'd never raced a Corvette before. And something happened that they tended to go light in the front end. Um, I told Ed, Ber Ed Welburn, if you'll maybe see the two photographs, that I decided that maybe I should do some front end modifications to both that Grand Sport Coupe and the, the number of the regular car right here. Uh, that happened at, at, uh, at Nassau, took the front end of it off, so it, did, it didn't frankly ruin the aerodynamics that bad. Uh, so actually that coupe, interestingly enough, is not bona fide because I had, we had to replace the front end of it with a fiberglass. We bought, bought a front end shell from Nikki Chevrolet and grafted it on before the Sebring race. Well, the Sebring race was the year of the flood. Um, it was unbelievable. I have a photograph here of a, another Grand Sport at Sebring, and it, the wake was unbelievable. Of course, with the great big tires, the strikes would go roaring past us. Uh, one, the, the, I think the race was won by uh, one of the shop rails by Jim Paul, probably in half sharp. It's mentioned that they had to put into the pits for a while during the race uh, because one thing that Jim Paul forgot to do was to put drain plugs in the, in the shop rail. So he had to sit in the pits for a while until they could get rid of the water in the cars. Um, the, I, I went on with, with the, the the coupe, I sold it on, and then uh, eventually bought this car here. Uh, and I can't remember how much I paid for it, but I know how much I sold it for. And I keep trying to tell Fred Simeon that I'll give you what I what I <laughs> sold it for if, if, you, if I could have it back. But needless to say, he's turned me down. So, it, but it's been great fun to have it here. He sometimes I think he goes up to his office and hides behind his desk when he lets me take it around the parking lot. <laughs> but uh, it, it was, was great fun, and it was a it, it was a dinosaur back in when I was racing it. But it had a certain amount of reliability. It also was rather wide, so it was very difficult to pass on the on the corners, which I would usually get into first going down the street. So I did quite well with it actually, but it was definitely obsolete. And that's what prompted me to sell it and then uh, go into normal race cars, if there is such a thing. <laughs> so that's a little bit of the history, my history of the Corvette Grand Sport and of Corvettes. Well, well now, the, the, the number nine coupe there, uh, originally that was red at, uh, at Daytona in 1966 when, uh, when Penske raced his first race.
and something happened and you had to improvise something. Well, uh, it took me quite a while sort of forensic research, thank God for Google, mm -hmm. because for a while I was blamed for taking the front end of that car off. I did find that uh, there was a record of a Triumph spinning out uh, just going on to the back of Daytona and I encountered him and took the front end of the car. Well, I came into the pits, needless to say, with quite a bit of chagrin. As I recall, Roger sent me right to the camp to go to bed. And Dick Goldstrand was charged with going back out during the night. Now, this is the middle of the night. Uh, he was immediately black flagged because of no headlights. So Roger, being as inventive as he's always been, got two flashlights. That met the letter of the rule. So he, he raised one of with, with the two flashlights. When I came out the next morning for my stick, I said, do you want me in that car? It was unbelievable, but somehow I think we had another. Eleven. Eleven. And we're all having spent God knows how much time in the, in the pits. Also, one of the things that got lost in the crash was a radiator. So Roger uh, somehow found a Corvette in the parking lot, talked the owner into borrowing his radiator. And that's what was put in the car, so we got into the race. And then uh, later on at Sebring, you again won the GT class. So, uh, you know, first first two times out for Pinsky Racing, uh, you won the races for that. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, Roger's uh, some of the sponsorship. Uh, well, I won't I won't ask him for a part of it, but I mean, it, it, uh, we did really well with those with that car. Uh, Ed, uh, you and Lowell, let's let's go back uh, to the production cars and uh, talk about the birth of the Stingray and how I, I remember vividly on television when the Corvette Stingray was introduced and what a huge, huge event that was, a uh, game changer. So tell us a little bit about how that came about. Well, let's start really with the Stingray Racer, which is really the heart of it all. And it was the late 1950s. Harley Earl had been running GM Design since 1928. And in his last years, he was doing, his cars were getting bigger and bigger, heavier and heavier, throwing more and more chrome on them. And he had a vision for the second generation Corvette, which was similar to the 58 Corvette, but with a, a bow tail fastback roofline on it and it had a lot of chrome. Bill Mitchell, who was part of the new wave of designers at GM, wanted to do something a lot leaner, a lot more fluid than what Harvey Earl was doing. And he began work on the Stingray Racer. Lowell talked about the Stingray Racer being done as a race car. But the inspiration for that design came from streamliners in Italy, very lean streamliners with, with uh, fender blisters over the tires. And that's really where the theme for the Stingray came from. Peter Brock developed some great sketches based on that inspiration. Uh, and Larry Shinoda was the person who really translated what was done in sketches into great forms for the Stingray racer, which led to the 63 Stingray, and every Corvette since then has been inspired by the original Stingray. Those shapes, those forms, even the most latest Corvettes. Yeah, so I remember um, when I was a wee boy, my father came home one day, he was a doctor in western Massachusetts, and he gave up, I guess sort of midlife crisis, gave up this Buick convertible for a, a 66 Marina Blue convertible, and the minute, in those days, I think Harry touched on this, when you had a Corvette in your neighborhood, you had a Stingray, you really stood out. I mean, it was, my neighbor who had an RS, his, his uh, father had an RS Camaro, suddenly it was toast. So, um, I think it's, it's almost, it's easy to underestimate the impact of that car when it came out, how dramatic it was. Ed's right, I know we had a big debate with Fred about whether the Disco Volante was the inspiration for that. Um, I know that's, I think Fred's view. But you can certainly see those shapes um, in, in the early Stingray. But what I love is the evolution from year to year, which of course keeps NCRS and Bloomington alive, is all these little changes that were made. And then uh, the evolution and what um, I just wrote about in another article was the famous six tail lamp 
uh, Stingray. So I think back in 65, there was a, what we used to what we call a GM, a mid-cycle enhancement. So there was going to be a visual refresh of the car. And one of the themes was that it had six tail lamps in the back. So some of you may know that there were a limited number of six tail lamp cars done um, for Wingate Chevrolet out in, in, uh, in California. But what I've always found interesting is all the show cars that GM did always had six tail lamps, but none of the production cars did. So it's a minor detail, but something that's always fascinating. Yeah, they they built one uh, built well. They built one for Harley Earl, who had already retired. But they built a very special Stingray for him. It had the six tail lamps, and then it had that exhaust that flowed out of the front fenders. And whenever Mitchell built something special, he was built something special for himself. He had quite a collection of very special and unusual cars. So, so just quickly, going back to that era, you know, um, Ed certainly has lived through this experience as well, um, but, you know, the executives would conjure up these cars themselves. So what, what in the lead up to the Stingray, not only was there the Stingray race car, but there was the Maple Shark. And so it was gradually dropping Yankees along the way. And of course, the Maple Shark, to your point, was sort of Bill Mitchell's personal car that happened to be a GM show car. But it, it really conveyed this shark theme this very aggressive design, and so when the final car came out, you know, you, you could tell where that was coming from of all that lead up, but even so, it was still a very dramatic car. Yeah, thank you. Now, we want to get Tony DeLorenzo involved here. Uh, in, the, uh, in the 60s and 70s, you know, the Corvette racing was really handled by independents, and I remember being at Daytona in 1970 and seeing you and uh, uh, your car is being pushed to the grid and, and admiring the beautiful preparation of your team uh, as, a, as an independent and not really knowing that much about you. How did Owens Corning Racing, you know, come about? And, uh, you know, tell us, uh, you know, some of the history of how you accomplished what you did. Well, we, uh, I got interested in racing. My, my uncle took me to the Meadowdale Raceway and uh, his company, which was a brewery, Peter Ham Brewery, had a race team. And uh, Harry Hoyer Jr. was the driver, and they had... And those, those were the scarabs. Right? The scarabs. Yeah. And I'm just giving this as a preamble. I walked up with my uncle to, we got about from here to that camera, away from the car, and the crew chief started the engine. And it was obviously a small block, probably about 390 inches four two-throat Weber carburetors and the exhaust sound just literally blew me away. I, and I said, right at that minute, I said to myself, somehow, some way, I'm gonna drive a race car. And I like to tell my friends, it was downhill from there. <laughs> so, uh, at any rate, uh, my brother and I started plotting to, uh, how am I gonna get a car, because we've gotta go. I started reading up on SECA, Sports Car Club of America, and uh, you had to be 21 years old. What a revolting development that was. <laughs> anyway, so as I was getting towards graduating from college, uh, we started working on my father about that. Will you get a corporate? Yeah. Well, God bless Dad. He made two mistakes. First, he agreed to get it. Second, he agreed to let us order it. So, we ordered heavy duty everything. 64 fuel injected Corvette, heavy duty four speed, um, heavy duty transmission, heavy duty brakes, and uh, the order went in. And I had a summer job at that point at Chevrolet. I think it was sales promotion. Judy asked me what I did and I can't remember. <laughs> well anyway, the phone rang. Hello? Tony, this is Zora Duntoff. <laughs> God called him. I mean, I couldn't believe it. He said, um, your father has ordered a heavy-duty Corvette. Who is going to drive it? And I was, still, I was still frozen in fear. I said, he is? <laughs> I told Judy, I said, I wish I could have been a fly in this wall and look at his expression as he rolled his eyes. So he said, again, who's going to drive it? I said, I am. What are you going to do with it? 
I'm going to take it to driver school at Watkins Glen. That's all I need to know. So when the car came to the house, it had a freshly scrubbed in set of Goodyear Blue Street race tires, which I'm sure Zora scrubbed in himself. And uh, we were off not long after that to, to Watkins Glen, but we prepared it for racing. So how do you do that? Put a roll bar in it. You got to chop five holes in the floor pan, so you rip the carpeting out. And then the spare tire carrier, and we, we modified the exhaust so we could put straight pipes out the back and take the mufflers off very quickly. And uh, bumpers and bumper brackets and all that stuff. So off we went to Watkins Glen, and I, I passed uh, the driver's school with flying colors, and we went back home. And <laughs> my dad had sold the car to one of his guys that worked for him in the Chicago office. And so he said, the car's got to go back to Chevrolet 440 uh, tomorrow. And my brother and I looked at each other and went, oh my God. So we didn't have time to do anything. We threw everything in the car. Bumpers, carpeting, spare tire carrier, on and on and on. Still had the open exhaust. I don't know. Trouble with that explanation. But anyway. The car went back and my dad called me up and said, um, when that car comes back to the house, don't touch it. Yes, sir. Anyway, so it took him two weeks to remanufacture it. He came back and it looked like it just came out of St. Louis. It was perfect. And sadly, it, it went to Chicago, where my dad's friend was, an employee. Anyway, uh, a couple of weeks later, it was stolen, and stripped, and burned. And I wish, I wish I still had it. I wish I did. Anyway, so that's how it all got started for me. And then we, we, uh, I got a, I raced. My dad said, "I'm going to give you a Corvair. You could do a Corvair." He said, "You can do whatever you want with it, but if you make it so that you can't drive it on the street, you're going to have to walk or take the bus." Yes, sir. And I immediately turned it into an A sedan for a race car. And I raced that car, I towed that car, I drove that car all over the place. And I, uh, Central Division, SECA, and I, after I graduated, I moved to Boston to do some graduate work in public relations. Gee, what a coincidence. <laughs> and anyway, uh, and the second semester, they sent me to New York for, for the second semester. And I remember asking the, the professor, I said, well, he's, the professor said, do you want to know why we picked you for this assignment? And I said, sure. He said, you didn't bother to tell us that your dad was vice president of public relations at General Motors Corporation. And that impressed me. So that was uh, when I started uh, wanting to go further and farther in racing, I, I was sending out proposals and uh, one of them landed on Hanley Dawson Jr.'s desk at Chevrolet dealership in Detroit, seven mile in the lodge. Anyway, uh, I went and made my proposal to him and then I, you know, I was forwarding up my, my papers and figuring he would say, well, thank you, no. I said, no, I think I'd like to do this. And he bought, the 1967 L88 Roadster, first one built that year of 20. He bought a trailer and he bought uh, a vehicle, or got a vehicle off his lot for us to tow it with. And he gave us expense money and we were off and running. And that year, I, I, won, I think I won the Central Division A production. And we went to the runoff the champion races they were at Daytona that year. and. Uh, I finished second, but he was happy with that. And, uh, but anyway, uh, so then uh, we decided we wanted to get a new car. I was going to order a new 68 L88 for the team because I had gotten to know Jerry Thompson uh, through my Corvair racing because he was, he was racing the Yanko Stinger at that point. So we decided we were going to do. Hanley Dawson told me, well, I tried to get the 68 L88, but they said that there weren't any more left. 
And I said, what? Anyway, so we said, okay, well, we'll just build one. <laughs> My brother Pete, he must have worn a groove in the, in the road from where, we, where our shop was up to the Chevrolet Otterburn warehouse. But we were getting parts from that place every day to put this car together. And uh, so we started out and we had a two car team. We started out both a production the 68 and the 67, with Jerry driving the 67. And then we, we um, said we were, we were doing pretty well, but then Andy told me that he was gonna have to stop sponsoring because of things that were going on. And so uh, I started sending out proposals to try to find sponsorship money. And in my high school days, I'd become a pen pal of Ed Cobo. Anyway, so we were having dinner with my parents at their club, and, and uh, in walked Ed Cole and Dolly Cole. And they came over to the table and said hi, and Dolly said, how are you doing with your racing? And I said, well, we're doing pretty well, but Henry Dawson just told us that Henry was gonna stop sponsoring us because of things that were going, I didn't ask him what was going on. But. So she said, do you have a proposal? I said, yes, can you get me a copy? Yes, ma'am. So anyway, she said, I'm going, to, I'm going to New York with Edward, because that's where they had the GM board meetings back then. She said, I want to give you a proposal, show it to somebody that I know. Well anyway, she marched into, and I forget the gentleman's name, I'm sorry, marched into his office. He was an executive vice president at Owens Cone Fiberglass. And Dolly was quite a spectacular woman, but she said, whatever his name is, <laughs> Johnny, I think you helped these boys. And I was at my desk at Rockwell the next Monday, and the phone rang, and it was Alan Carabin from Toledo, and he said, we have your proposal, and we'd like to have a meeting. So. And the rest is history. Owens Corning Fiberglass began their sponsorship with us, and they sponsored us from the middle of 58, I mean, the middle of 68 till uh, uh, January of 71. And, uh, and they were the suppliers of fiberglass for the Corvette, correct? Yes. So it was, there, there was a good time. Yeah, they had a good reason. They wanted to get their message out to, well, not only GM, but the rest of the, rest of the uh, and then you went on to, uh, you know, to fame and uh, success internationally. What was it like, you know, as an independent to be racing internationally like that? Well, um, you know, we, we didn't think about it a lot, obviously, because we were kids. But anyway, we, we worked very hard. And it, thanks to Zora and uh, Gib Elstead, you know, we never got any money from General Motors, but we had a we had a parts program with Corvette Engineering, and so we would try, you know, new, we put hours on a new gearbox or, or hours on the rear end and do other work like that, keep track of the hours and turn them in. So, I mean, that that helped budgets and stuff, but uh, we we had really good success by winning. Central Division A Production Championship several times, and uh, we won the Daytona 24-hour the GT Class at 70 and 71. Uh, 70 was Jerry's uh, car, and then 71 was, was my car. 71, we finished fourth overall, and first at GT. And uh, we won the GT Class at Sebring in 70, and uh, we just, uh, had an amazing run, and uh, we built another car after that, sponsored by the Bud Company. And for the first time in our history, we had racing engineers that knew what they were doing that had developed the Ford GT, uh, Mitch Markey and Lee Dexter. And we had the 73 Bud car, B U D D, uh, was probably at the time the most sophisticated equipment on the track. And, uh, we couldn't, unfortunately, keep engines in it. But we, uh, we did a lot of damage with it, theoretical damage. It, it ran, it was really fast. Yeah. 